The Taming of Nan by Ethel Carney Chapter 14 Adam Speaks Seven moons one after another peeped through Cherrydale's trees that broke the bareness of the land about. It was going to be a white yule, such as Christmas cards are made from. Every step of Cherrydale's lanes now would have made Christmas vignettes. Every blush was a blossom with puffs of snow, as though trying to mimic May. White roofs, window ledges, gardens. Dawns came up over the dumb sheeted hills, with torch of gold blazing over a world in its winding sheet. At noon the village would be trying to shovel itself a path from each one of the little doors, and a path down the one street, only to have it covered again in the night time. Afternoons had sapphire and emerald skies, against which hips and doors that had managed to poke through tumbles of snow burnt blood red. The brutes wandering in all directions were lamp black, when the sun sank, the moon came up. The hills changed from blinding white to lavender and rose pink, then into silver under that moon, after the sapphire of the sky had faded into that wash of Iceland green that heralded night. Every stone wall was snow-blown, some were entirely hidden. The rough broken landscape was buried under a soft graciousness without one single line of ugliness. It was a super beauty that had in it something almost uncanny. Cherry had not been out with his pack for a whole week, but he was not worrying. He was peddler monarch in the dale. A year and a half had given Cherry a good grip on the feminine heart of the little villages. His success as the little peddler was becoming as assured as had been that of the big porter. Nan had as yet had no relapse. There was peace in the Cherry Castle. But Jerry had one care. He was not satisfied about Polly. The making of her into a woman appeared to put a strain upon her. She was thin. She never sat down in the old easy adolescent way. He missed the foolish lightness of her giggle. She had let all her frocks down. She was working hard, of course. Every week she was singing somewhere. The religious bodies found that fresh hark of voice an asset, and a cheap asset. Even Nan noticed the tower Polly was altering. It was our Polly now, not that bitch. The fear of God in Nan's case had worked out on the side of greater politeness and the scrubbing brush. Nan was Christmas decorating, though it was yet eight days to Christmas. She was mounted on a pair of squat wooden steps, hanging Moses and Daniel with fancy paper trimmings in a kitchen that had red firelight and lamplight. Tea was spread waiting for Polly. She's here, said Nan. She was. Rag went into his usual delirium. For a pedigree dog, Rag was a demonstrative, uncontrolled savage. He began to lick Polly's boots as she came into the range of firelight. Polly had indeed changed, but the blurred softness ensuing from her plumper condition had hidden some of her beauty, it seemed, now. Even the slight look of strain that had grown into her expression had added that touch of character without which any face fails to attract for long. Anything from Becky? she asked. She asked it as she had never failed to ask. Without rhyme or reason, Becky had suddenly stopped writing to her. There's a letter there from Narrowfields, her mother told her. Polly flew to it with a touch of her old likeness. Is it from Becky? asked Cherry. Hmm, said Polly excitedly. She knelt down on the fender to read it. Summer up, Polly, queried her dad, watching her face. Oh, she murmured, oh, and broke into a passion of tears. Nan picked up the letter and read it. She's come to a misfortune, said the shrew. She says she's going to a workhouse. Polly sobbed again. She sat sniffing at intervals over her tea, but the attitude of her parents towards Becky did not encourage her to follow the course she had thought to take, to ask Becky to come there. Polly was not built to beat things down. After a second cup of tea, she ceased to cry. Apparently, she regarded Becky as lost. Pansy laid an egg this morning, she told her parents, less sniffily after a while. Good last Pansy, said Jerry. I didn't think she'd lay paving stones, did said Polly. Oh, it was such a nice little egg, said Polly. A little egg, said Cherry. There's a lot of strength in first eggs, Polly informed him. 
Polly, as an authority on food values, was too comical. Cherry burst into laughter. Bring it for the lad, he said. I need all strength I can get. He, that a greedy swine, said Nan. If everybody looked after number one, said Cherry amiably, there'd be no number twos, would there? For a generous man, he had the old passion of liking to appear a selfish brute. Granny's cough any better? asked Cherry. His week of snowbound martyrdom had kept from him the doings of the village. Polly nodded. Granny had impressed upon Polly that if ever she told of her old dues, she would cut her off with a shilling. She'll live to be hundred, said Cherry. Well, here's health to the best mother-in-law in the world and to my wife's husband. Something glug-glugged out of a bottle into his cup. It was sufficiently near Yule for the action to be justified. We'll have a goose, he said dreamily. One of them big bumping white fellas with yellow feet and fat as creases your chin. We'll have open house, we'll. That doesn't know what'll happen afore Christmas, Nan told him grimly. Nan was always sitting on coffins to survey the world now. After tea, Polly went upstairs and Nan went down to see Granny. Polly had reached a crisis in her life. Polly was burning up love letters, valentines, photos. Adam Wilde had asked her to meet him before choir practice and walk with him to Witchgate and back. Adam had indeed ploughed his furrow deep. Music, queried Cherry as she came down, her portfolio in her hand. She nodded. Music. All life was music tonight, forever and forever and forever. She was going to be happy. Music. The world itself was music. As she stepped out into it, a huge spreading blossom of crystal purity lying under a white moon in a great silence. She sang as she went down the hillside. It was an old French gavotte. Adam had told her how brocaded dames and fine bows had danced to it. As she lilted it, they seemed to trip along with her down the white hillside, dancing, dancing. Then she recalled Becky, just for a moment, Becky was sad. Should one friend be glad when another was sad? But, oh, how could she be sad? Adam Wilde had asked her to walk to Witchgate and back with him. Walk with him. She became fay. She danced down the hillside, changing her song. It was Tartini's devil dance now. Little Imp seemed to trip down the hillside with her. Dancing, dancing, rig a jig, jig, under the light of the moon. She stopped and began to gather handfuls of white snow and to toss it away, watching it sparkle. But the cold made her hands ache. Her hands that she had been so vain of were chapped now, always. Sometimes they bled, but always she had the ecstasy of knowing that she was getting a little nearer to that ideal woman of Adam Wilde's, strong, hard-working, useful, odd and grey. Tonight he was going to ask her to be his mate. She was sure of it. He had made love to her in every way but that of common speech, ever since Bob went away, especially. He had endeavoured to mould her mind, and the giggling Polly had painfully plodded through boots she did not like. Always he had given her to understand that he did this because her destiny was mixed in with his. When she had showed him the pats of butter she had made all by herself, when Sarah was sick, he had told her she was going to be a fine little wife for a farmer, and his hair now brown eyes had said, Which farmer? At the bottom of Thomas Hill were two flat fields intersected only by a low hedge. No foot had trodden their whiteness. They sparkled fairly under the moon. What fantasies are not hidden in the art of girlhood? Down in the heart of girlhood, down the glistening track of the moonbeams on the first of these white fields, Polly waltz, whistling Tartini's devil dance, up and down, down and up, from one end of it to the other, her shadow dancing with her, while she drew all that glory of whiteness into her very soul, and the memory of those days when she had felt sick and lost, and up against bars in narrow fields, was danced under her feet. A strong man, a good man, a man who could take care of her, Cared for her, foolish, joy-loving, peril-daring little Polly. Ooh, she said. She floundered into a bush, 
Snow was powdered over her. She looked dazedly at the moon. The fit of ecstasy was over. She walked demurely towards the place where she was to meet Adam. She saw his shadow on the whiteness of the snow, the boys that had waited for her like this, but never one whose shadow she had loved. He saw her coming. She tried to walk steadily, but her knees shook under her. The foolish heart was glad and afraid. To think that a man like Adam Wiles should care for a foolish creature like Polly Cherry. She couldn't quite credit it yet. Which way? he asked. Adam's voice was not quite steady either. He had come out to punish this girl who had meant to fool his brother. Her face looking in his direction as he waited had unnerved him. He had done his work well. Up the hill, chose Polly, right up into the stars. Her giggle was tremulous. It was funny to choose the path for the eye-handed Adam. Before them rose an upland field of white. A little path was trodden up its face. A dog had rolled down it. Polly's feet tripped along. Their two shadows went before. They kept almost guiltily apart, these two shadows. Adam's looked like a Cossack's, for his hat was exaggerated on the snow. Polly's hat took the shape of a poke bonnet. A penny for your thoughts, said Adam. I was thinking, said Polly, about Becky christening you John Willie from heaven. Adam laughed. He stopped to show her Orion. Then they went on again. The world seemed trying to dissolve itself into light. Stars overhead and underfoot drifted snow flashing like powdered gems. The singing of snow-frosted rushes was the only sound about them as they topped the slope, walking towards Witchgate, going by the golf links, white, smooth, and with only the shadows of the barriers upon them. They discussed Handel, set him above all others. Then they got on to Grieg, and quite suddenly, Polly was singing one of Grieg's cradle songs, exquisite as it floated between snow and stars. Then they discussed cradle songs in general, and Adam sang what he thought was the finest one in existence, an outlaw's cradle song about being rocked in the heather and defying the world. They had really to keep on talking. At last they stopped. The path went downwards. Which gate was in sight? A white village set by a black sheet of water. They could hear dogs barking from its road far below them. Adam leaned on a gate. Polly stood beside him. Adam went into the history of which gate. So long as they kept talking, talking, they did not feel the awkward silence. They stood so long by the gate that Polly's feet got quite cold. We shall have to go back, said Adam. He had meant to tell her by the gate, but his courage had failed. Between the gate and reaching the downward slope, they fell back on music once more. It was as they began to ascend the slope, with Cherrydale going to burst on them at any moment, that Adam nerved himself for the actual confession. We can rest here a little, he said. Polly stopped. She was in a dream. I suppose, said Adam, making himself hold on to that ploughshare of justice, you will wonder why I asked you to come to Witchgate with me. Hmm, she nodded. Her voice was almost inaudible. She was looking down at the snow. I thought you and Miss Thorpe were very friendly, said Adam. Do you think she would marry me? He had told her now that he just thought her a little fool, that all this fooling of his had meant nothing. For pity's sake, he did not look at her for a moment, but her long silence made him fear she had gone dumb. She was holding on to a fence, staring at him. If she had gone into hysterics, he would not have been surprised. She was struggling. She was so white, he recalled a pink blush and pink sunbonnet on a faraway morning, and felt sick. I thought you might know if she liked me, he added. I, I, I don't know, said Polly. If there had not been Sag Farm, a cloak blew out from her listless grasp. He had a fool's impulse to fold it round her, but the older passion held sway. Set yourself to do a thing, and do it. That was the creed of the wilds. None of the wilds had held it as more of an iron law than this last struggler to retain the old soil 
that had grown round the roots of so many of them. They walked back down to Cherrydale. Polly walked with difficulty. The world was one huge blur of white that hurt her eyes. Her eyes smarted with tears she did not dare to shed. The moon was a leering, idiotic face. I think Miss Thorpe will make you a good housewife, she said once. Her attempt to speak brightly hurt Alan. He felt sorry that he had dealt her this blow before the choir practice. She would have to sing. If only she had not been such a little fool. If only there had not been Sag Farm. They entered the little chapel. The others had arrived. Are you sick, Polly? whispered the little mezzo. Polly shook her head. You look so white, said the other. Do I? asked Polly. I'm a bit cold. Music. She had never, never dreamed music could be so awful that she could hate it so much. There was an eternity of it. Every note was like a funeral wail. Fancy the conquering hero sounded like that. It was all wrong. Something was the matter with it. When she had to stand up and sing, the nightmare reached its height. It was a nightmare. She was sure of it. She was singing and had made two mistakes and the others were staring at her and she was trying to laugh. But at last it was all over. They came out into the moonlight. The great smarting behind Polly's eyes was fire now. The trees they passed weren't real. They were dead images of trees with awful weights of snow on them. The others went to make a great snowball and roll it down from Witchgate Slope. Adam said he would walk a gate with Polly. Are you going to see Miss Thorpe now? asked Polly. They were walking under the shadow of two elms, white, ghostly things. Adam nodded. He had half done his task tonight. He would go on to the Thorpes. Well, said a hard little voice, you might go and ask Susan for her money and her life, but you're a little late. Your brother Bob is going to marry her, so Sag Farm is gone. Adam stared at Polly in the moonlight. He received two concurrent shocks. The first was the news of Susan, the sound of Sag Farm falling. The other was Polly's fit, scornful loot, in which he saw himself a madman with a mania who had set all things after that mania. Blind bat! Susan had been in love with his brother. He recalled that walk to Cherrydale Fair. He looked dazedly at Polly. He half stretched his hand out to her appealingly. She drew back. Her loot was unutterable. Polly had found herself. The pride of that long line of cherry dames had awakened. Not, she said in that hard frosty voice, if you crept on your hands and knees. With which she left him. A door closed. She had passed into Granny's. In the vernacular, Adam had lost the half-penny and the cake. Strangely enough, he was most bothered about the cake now. He felt afraid of going up to Sag Farm. Sag Farm that had stood between him and the sunshine of youth, of carefree manhood, and this foolish girl, whom he had only considered from a point of view of usefulness as a housekeeper. He struck up towards the clouds. An hour's steady walking over the crisp snow made him feel a little less demoralised. At some moments he felt he could win Polly over. At others the memory of that look of hers burnt in his brain. It was like having one's inner meanness discovered by a child. On and on, until the glory of white hills rose around him into a sky of moonshire blue, drifting clouds like other snow mountains. Then, across the snow, something bounded towards him, it was the Thorpe dog. Even as he stopped to pat it, he knew whose were the two figures coming along, lover close. Susan and Bob had been to look at the spot where they had buried the sheep. They came up to him. The brothers had never spoken since that night of the quarrel. Sometimes since, Bob had worked for the Thorpes. Adam had passed him on the road. The dog gave a glad bark to draw their attention to him. Mean... That was what Polly Cherry's glance had said he was. Good night, Miss Thorpe, said Adam. The two lovers stared, recognising the man in the shadow of the stone wall. Good night, said Susan. She was giving Bob a little nudge with her elbow. Adam saw her. 
she was reminding him that he was youngest. Then, to Bob Wilde's utter astonishment, his proud brother spoke. Forgive me, Bob, he said simply. And then the two hands had met, and Susan was smiling. There was nothing for it but that Adam should go with them and have some supper at the Thorpes's. He went, whilst his wonder grew that he could ever have thought Susan in love with him. Moreover, in that strange reflection of himself that had looked at him from Polly's eyes, he didn't feel that he had been fit to tie Susan's shoelaces. The fact that he would have married her for her domestic virtues and the pot of brass covered him with shame. He tried not to look like the criminal, he felt. Jabez full of winks, Mrs. Jabez between tears and smiles, Ned Thorne looking and laughing very loudly, would have told Adam the truth, even had he not met the couple over the clouds. He learnt that Uncle Nat was very poorly. Thou wants to go and keep him warm, Adam, Mrs. Thorpe told him. I shouldn't wonder, but he's a bit of money. Adam smiled. Uncle Nat's as poor as a crow, he said, but I'll walk over and see him tomorrow, maybe. When he passed Granny's cottage on his way home, he saw Polly's shadow cross the white blind. He stood to watch it pass again, that girlish shadow of the floating hair and candlestick in hand. But the window grew dark. He climbed the hill after crossing the old wishing bridge. Sarah was sitting up. The light came from the two windows and the gap under the door. It was the old, demonic, grinning face that had struck his childish fancy as a child when he hung on to his mother's skirts, and she had told him tales of that grandfather of his, ingraining into his mind the idea of the awful thing it would be if ever they had to leave it. Father in bed, he asked Sarah on entering. She turned an anxious face. I thought it were him now, she said. Is he out? asked Adam, for the inn was closed. They sat an hour waiting, but all Wilde did not come. Get the lantern and we'll go out look for him, said Sarah, tearfully at length. He, Adam, it's been a mistake, lad, hanging on here. We ought to have got out on it when Mother did. The place has gotten on his nerves. Some men is like that. We shall have to get out now, said Adam grimly. I'll tell that town chap to do his worst tomorrow. Even yet he clung to some foolish hope of saving Sag Farm. He crossed the yard and into the missile. He was worried about his father, but the worst thought that entered his head was that the old man, half drunk, had slipped in the dark, hurt himself, and could not get up. He groped his way into the missile. Adam knew every inch of the place, even in the pitch dark. The lantern hung on a hook in the farthest corner. He went straight to it. As he went, he collided with something between himself and the lantern hook. Dad, he queried. He thought that his father had lost himself in his drunken state, got into the missile instead of the house. His hand went out. He touched something cold. He shrank back. The head of his head stood on end as he struck a match. Then his voice went out in a yell of appeal. Sarah! When Sarah arrived on the scene, Adam had cut his father down. The woman with the taper saw him with the old man trying artificial respiration. I've killed an old man, an old man, he was saying, for bricks and mortar, I've killed an old man. Sarah, with a long breath, lit the lantern. No change took place in the empurpled countenance. From the roof of the missile, the suspending rope, cut by Adam's knife, swung to and fro. A little scrap of paper caught Sarah's eyes. It said so little, yet so much. Sag farmers kill me. Forgive me, Addy. I couldn't stick it. We mun burn this, said the ghost of a woman, bent also with her struggle under Sag Farm. Nay, said Adam. The policeman arrived eight minutes later, and the doctor. Life was extinct. The crazy old farmer had been dead over an hour, even whilst the children sat anxiously over the supper table. The fact they had not heard him come in was explained by his having left his boots at the foot of the hill, where they were found next morning, half full of thaw rain and snow broth from the dripping trees. After that first outburst in the missile, Adam said no more. The publication of the message in the local papers the discussion in the village, the eyes that followed him, Adam bore without outward token of emotion. He had lost Sag Farm. 
Indirectly, he had killed his father. Polly Cherry flirted with the base in her old way. Nay, divers strange youths appeared in Cherrydale that very weekend. The Celt in Polly was roused. People began to ask Cherry which of the lads was the one. He winked a knowing wink. He also had a little conversation with Polly, which left him just as much in the dark as before. Whilst Polly, Polly with over-bright eyes, a hard look that gave her a stronger resemblance to Belle Harker, covered up the paleness of her face with rouge and covered it very badly. A few people said she ought to be expelled from the choir, but after all, her voice was a cheap asset and no one could say anything definite. Whilst the anomaly of the human nature that could render, I know that my Redeemer liveth in angelic sweetness and turn its back on Adam Wilde in his black clothes, to laugh with the bass became one of those things only to be explained by a great inward conflict. The more the strain told in her face, the more rouged Polly used. The harder she laughed, the more she flirted, the more locks of her hair she sent out, calling back to her those devotees who had not forgotten her. As for Cherry and Nan, they sat and looked at one another more than they had ever done in their lives. Granny talked in vain. Polly sat and smiled in a cold, tired, remote way. All that she would vouch was, Oh, I'm tired to good people. The Arkers were on top now, and the Arkers, when once they got going, were a lot that didn't know when to stop till too late. Dear Polly, forgive me from the proud Adam, while said farm furniture was ticketed, had not the slightest effect. Pansy was carried back to him by a small boy, also the dry boots that had made her headache. Cherry was laying stuff in for Christmas. He was also trying to think round the problem of Peter. Peter had been the last to answer the call of the siren's hair. If he had had his feet, he would have punched Peter till he had to stay in bed for a few weeks, by which time Polly might have been expected to have become normal. Something, said Cherry to Nan, had thrown the lass off her trolley. She would get back again, maybe, if Peter could be kept out of the way. As he sat in his nook, he was very busy using his three ounces. Adam Wilde went to see Uncle Nat, who very thankfully took the five shillings Adam offered him for nourishments, whilst the idea that the poor old man was thought by the Thorpes to be worth keeping warm on the score of brass amused Adam, as far as he could be amused in this black hour. Every day that he spent at Sag Farm now was begrudged. It weighed on him like a black shadow of troubled conscience. A bill appeared on the farm walls, by the roadsides, on gable ends, advertising all stock, household goods, utensils, farm implements, to be sold by auction in the yard behind the peep inn. His graven image was gone. Sometimes he walked about in the road looking up to see Polly's shadow fall on that white blind. He realised now that that irritation she had made him feel that night in the wheat field had been the beginning of this. He had looked down on her as a feather-brained, feather-hearted fool. The tables were reversed now. Some men see themselves as others see them in one moment. Adam had been such. Intellectually his inferior physically weaker, she had condemned him by the simplicity of a childish heart that regarded him in the light of a liar, a thief, and a coward, to have thought to walk to Susan Thorpe, take her money and her life, when it was her foolish self he liked. That this hardness lay under the softness of the nature she had hitherto revealed, made him realise that the same county had bred her, Christmas, the last Christmas in the old place, drew near. Bob Wilde and Susan Thorpe were asked out for the first time in Cherrydale Church, and the spectacle of Polly Cherry in a great white muff and fur that made the rouge more noticeable, walking out with first one lad, then another, was close to him always, allied hauntingly with the memory of that cut rope swinging in the draught in the old missal. His lips closed more firmly one on the other. Adam 
was taking his medicine. He took it like a hard wild, but the cup was not yet drunk to its lees.